our first speaker of the day is Tabea Isali. Uh, hello. Hi, good morning or evening. <laughs> yes, good morning or evening. Joining us, I believe, from Switzerland. Exactly, yes. Yes, uh, where, yes, uh, lots of things that you've, you've done. Uh, worked for multiple renowned Swiss game companies and universities and founded Stardust, an indie studio developing meaningful and diverse games. Uh, also in your free time, a Women in Games Ambassador, which is a program I've sometimes been involved in. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, and yeah, you're here to talk about a perennial topic. I believe that one of the Zoom unconferencing rooms last night was also about nonviolent roguelikes. Oh, wow. That's because amazing. I think that almost perhaps every year that we've had unconferencing, this has been an unconferencing topic. So Okay. Yeah. No pressure on me, I guess. <laughs> well, hey, you know up front, everybody loves the topic. So Perfect. yeah. Take it away. All right, wonderful. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, this is me, Tabea. I'm a game de developer from Zurich, Switzerland. And, you know, besides creating games, I also love to play games, of course. Uh, my favorite genres are competitive games and probably to nobody's surprise, roguelikes. So nothing too out of the ordinary so far, I would say. Um, but as a game developer and the CEO of a small game studio, I like to think a little bit outside of the box. You know, not too much outside of the box, just a little bit. And that's why I asked myself the question, how hard could it be to create a non-violent roguelite dungeon crawler? So yeah, uh, this talk will be about Grimmar Groves, our upcoming roguelite dungeon crawler about growing plants and friendships. In Grimmar Groves, you are exploring a mythical forest, grow plants with your witch magic, and hopefully in the end, you will solve the mystery of the rainbow socks. So now you might ask yourself the question, you know, why would we even want to create a non-violent roguelite dungeon crawler? And the short answer is, well, money. Um, for this project, we started with a market research and we believe that there's a market for such a game. After all, roguelikes are a lot of fun. They are amazing. But, you know, they also tend to be very dark and gritty. You're always slaying some, I don't know, skeletons and demons and grotesque monsters. And usually it's also set in a dungeon or basement or cellar, which is very dark. And don't get me wrong, it's not that I have an issue with dark and gritty games. However, I also wouldn't mind some variety sometimes. And if you look at games such as Hades, Boyfriend Dungeons or Don't, Don't Starve, you can see that there are a lot of players who are newly getting into roguelite dungeon crawlers who usually would rather play games like uh, Animal Crossing or Stardew Valley. So cozy games about na nature, friendship, uh, you know, well, ha happy things. So with the rise of cozy and uh, cute games, we thought, why not go all the way? Why not create a roguelite dungeon crawler, which is about um, happy things and friendship and nature? So after all, you know, um, roguelikes always have been a mixture between genres. It's always, um, a, I don't know, a base builder with roguelite elements. It's a card deck game with roguelite elements. And if you ask people why they exactly like roguelikes, you can see that there's a, a huge variety and it's very diverse de depending on uh, the individual players. But also B, um, there is already a lot of overlap with farming sims. So both, both genres are um, promoting individual solution strategies. So they're kind of sandboxy. Uh, they are about managing resources. They have simple repeating gameplay and so on. So with these similarities and with our, our market research, we decided to go ahead with the project and um, uh, uh, start you know, a concept phase. Um, so yeah, how did we do that? Well, we started with the familiarities that I just talked about because they were very important to us. Um, not only because it's easier to build on something that other developers already 
worked on and you kind of can you know learn from what they did but also because uh people like to play games that are kind of familiar with what they played before and what they love so our plan was to adopt roughly 70 percent from games and the genres that we were looking at so roguelite dungeon crawlers and farming sims and you know take one-to-one -one the working mechanics so for example we were pretty sure from the start that we wanted to have um, a, a core game loop where you start in your home base you explore uh, a, a series of procedurally generated levels and once you run out of health you return home and start over then we wanted to have roughly 20 percent which is innovative so adaptations of familiar and proven elements so for example we wanted to have a traditional combat system from roguelite dungeon crawlers but create a non-violent version of it and then the last 10 percent would be experimentations so new things uh, uh exploration you know things that players may not be familiar with and well you know that was our plan and at first it worked out uh, we started with our concept we had our core gameplay loop you know very traditional but instead of exploring a dark dungeon you would uh, go into a colorful forest instead of killing enemies you would use your weapons which in our case were um, magical witch spells and grow plants uh, instead of looting the dead bodies for money you would be able to gather fruits from the plants uh, you have grown and instead of buying upgrades with the money you collected you would be able to craft these spoons yourselves and of course you know health wouldn't be our main um, game over condition but rather energy and once you run out of energy you have to return home so as you can see the whole gameplay loop is very similar in terms of mechanics i would say the the difference is mostly on a narrative level and yes there were some topics that were kind of challenging for us to you know align them with our concept so for example boss mechanics were kind of a challenge because usually at the end of every level there's a boss and it prevents you from progressing further um, but we of course we could have a, a big plant um, that uh, 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 is harder to uh, grow but why would it prevent you from advancing to the next level right so sure we had some things that we needed to think about more in depth but basically nothing that we thought would be impossible for us to solve so at that point we were pretty confident um, we went into prototyping with the expectation that we could you know just have a look at uh, our favorite roguelite games um, look at their uh, combat mechanics um, and adapt them to fit our non-violent concept so we started prototyping we set up some first tests for the environment we made some placeholder spells um, we created some basic plants and we tried it out and well as you can see you know it looked bad it didn't feel too well um, but you know it's a first prototype so that's kind of fine and we decided you know let's just add some juice choose the thing that every game developer probably has seen at least one inspiring talk about be it choose it or lose it or the outer screen shake basically every article uh, video or talk about game feel because we knew that game feel is very important for roguelite dungeon crawlers so we tried to design our game accordingly and um, uh, add it as early as possible and you know so we did we added more effects screen shake you know whatnot and um, it it kind of started to take shape but just not the shape that we envisioned because you see there's one tiny issue with choose 
And I'm gonna illustrate that with an example. Uh, so I took all the tips from uh, Jan Willem Neyman's The Art of Screen Shake and, um, well, you know, side note, uh, no shade on the art of screen shake. Uh, uh, it's, it's basically, uh, just convenient because I found this list online and I was able to copy and paste it into my slides. So I could have taken any other guide, um, but I was just lazy. So yeah, if you look at the list, you can see that almost half of the techniques, uh, are directly, directly relating to violence. Uh, and weapon, you know, like explosions and so on. And then you have some techniques which are basically there to enhance the impact of said violence. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, these techniques are bad or like morally questionable or something like that. No, they are amazing if you want to create the game about combat, right? Uh, which we didn't. <laughs> so, yeah. Of course, it doesn't mean that like all of these techniques that I marked are completely useless for a non-violent game. Of course, you could also create a hit animation when the plants are receiving energy from a spell. Um, it's just that I can't use the standard solutions, uh, you know, uh, uh, flashing the sprite white for a split second and uh, add some screen shake and some knockback and call it a day. No, it rather was like, that we had to find solutions, how we can enhance the feeling of growing plants and absorbing energy. And that means that we cannot fall back on genre conventions to guides and talks and so on. It rather felt like we had to experiment a lot, uh, find our own solutions and create things from scratch. So, you know, what am I trying to say? Is this a 30 minute sub story about how hard my job is? I mean, you know, newsflash, somebody found out that creating games is hard. No, of course not. Um, but the thing is, it's not only a challenge for us as game developers, if we can't just you know, rely on um, genre conventions, but it's also hard for the players if a game doesn't look and feel the way they are used to. So at its core, this story is about game literacy and what we as an industry have cultivated for the past 50 years, or rather the things that we haven't cultivated. So what is game literacy? Well, um, hmm. all of us through playing games learned a certain kind of vocabulary, the vocabulary that games are using to talk to us, such as uh, health related topics usually are read, uh, you know, the concept of uh, uh, health bars, uh, or if you jump in a game that you usually do that by pressing the A button or space bar, or uh, if you are playing a platformer game that you run from the left to the right and not the other way around. So whenever we are playing games, we are learning things. And when we start a new game that we haven't played before, we can rely on what we learned before and we don't need to, you know, explore everything from uh, scratch again. Um, and let me tell you, roguelikes are filled to the brim with such rules and conventions. We all know, you know, roguelikes are about dying over and over and over again. Uh, we know that we will lose a part of our resources or all of our resources once we die. We know that there will be upgrades and wounds, but that they, are, uh, that they also might be lost on death. Um, yeah, you know, stuff like that. And Yes, these are genre conventions, so we might be aware that we had to learn them uh, because, you know, they are not as common in other games and other game genres. But below that layer of uh, roguelike conventions, um, there is a whole huge, you know, list of basic game vocabulary that we are so used to um, and we have been using them for such a long time that we might not even realize anymore that we actually had to learn them at some point. So let me make an example for that as well. We all know that in most games, if you touch an enemy, uh, that will cause damage. 
And, you know, yes, in some cases, we do not need to rely on game literacy to know that. I mean, it's probably not too shocking that getting touched by this lovely gentleman is not going to be especially pleasant. But what about this example? I mean, it's just a cute little turtle. And if you have zero game literacy, how would you know that touching the turtle kills you? So, I mean, you know, it could be anything. It could be that you can pet the turtle. It could be that you can ride it. It could be that you can feed it some lettuce. Uh, maybe you could even collect it and cook some turtle soup. I don't know, you know, um, it, it's, um, it, it's, 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 Nothing about this turtle tells you, you know, I'm going to fuck you up really bad. And yet we know because we have played other games before. So why is this relevant for us creating a nonviolent game? Well, to stay with this example, all our lives we have learned in games that touching things means ouchie. And, you know, now we crazy people come in and we're like, well, actually, um, this is a nonviolent game. And poof, just like that, a remarkable part of your game literacy goes down the drain. Suddenly you have all these questions of, okay, but what happens if Godric touches me? And what is my game over condition? And, you know, what do I even do? Because usually when I get into a game, I just start smashing things because that's what I do in games. So. Now you have to completely relearn how such a game would work. And we as game developers have to tell you because that's such a lengthy process. This might be even a very unfun, unfun experience for the both of us. So yeah, the takeaway is don't make a nonviolent game. I mean, no, of course not, but to us, it was very important to learn that the biggest challenge for creating Grimoire Groves is not creating fun, nonviolent mechanics, but rather to find the right balance when it comes to relying on game literacy or when to subvert it. And, you know, just that little change of uh, wanting to make the game nonviolent meant that we had to rather make sure that we can minimize the subversion than the other way around. Now, of course, you could go, you know, full uh, philosophical here and ask the question, you know, what does that say about us as a game industry? And that's a very inter interesting question, but I don't really have the time to go into that. So I leave this to you. And instead, I would use the remaining time in my talk to um, explore how we approach this challenge of um, balancing literacy, game literacy versus subverting it, and how we choose up the game uh, without screen shake and explosions. So uh, I don't have 30 tips, I just got seven. And I mean, I guess once we're done with the development, we pro probably would have 30 tips, but yeah, it's seven tips uh, for today. So um, let's dive right in. All right. Um, the first point is character design. And we worked a lot on character design because, you know, in traditional roguelikes, we know that we just need to kill things. And um, a lot of games does have very simple uh, sprites and animations. So if you look at this example from Vampire Survivors, you can see uh, it's basically just two sprites um, switching between each other's and that's absolutely enough. But we had to make sure that players understand what is happening to the plant creatures when they are interacting with them. So we came to the point where we created multiple stages for each of our plant creatures to tell the players, you know, hey, if you cast spells on the plants, uh, they will grow and they will bloom. And this also tra directly translates into my second point, character animations. So while it might be enough for a traditional roguelike game that you just say, you know, um, if the 
enemy gets hit, we flash the sprite white for a second and um, uh, once the enemy is dead, uh, you know, we just despawn the object. But our uh, animations had to be intricate enough to tell the players exactly what was going on so that the plants are you know growing and once they are fully grown they're happily jumping into the ground spawning their fruits and you could harvest them so we as players are so used to kill things in games that everything we did with our plant creatures every design part was basically about telling players you are not killing these plants. You know, even stuff like uh, spawning loot. So usually in uh, roguelike games, um, once you kill the enemy, the, the, the loot just drops out and you can pick it up. And we did the exact uh, same thing because, you know, this game mechanic is not inherently violent. And yet, because we are so used to it, it just still felt like you're, you know, stabbing this plant and the, the guts fall onto the ground and the plant is like, ah! <laughs> and yeah, so we kind of had to change it. Um, so what we did was we just conveniently replaced the game literacy basically from uh, roguelike games with what we already have learned from farming games. So, you know, in every farming game, uh, you can press a button to harvest the fruit. And we just added that. And could in this case, we basically were using game literacy to our, our advantage, which is pretty cool. <laughs> All right. So those are examples for uh, our plant creatures and they are a huge aspect in our game. But the other big challenge for us were spells. So for spells, we wanted to start with um, very basic uh, uh, visual uh, communication uh, uh, techniques. So you probably have already seen this example on the left side on, of the slide um, with the, the, the dogs from the Pixar movie Up. Um, and how uh, pointy shapes are communicating aggression and danger while round uh, uh, resting shapes are communicating, you know, uh, positive things like friendliness and, uh, and like that. So, yeah, we try to use a lot of rounds of shapes and friendly colors to make the game feel uh, nurturing and friendly and that did work to uh, a certain extent but especially with the spells um, uh, and most of all with with projectiles it just still felt like you are hurting the plants so we did a lot of experiments and no matter you know what we were throwing at the plants it could even be a pink fluffy cotton ball it was just still feeling violent so uh, that's when we started to look at how healing spells in games are working because you know it's not that every single thing you do in games is violent uh, no I, and especially in in um, mmos there are a lot of healing spells and healing classes and most of the or a lot of these spells are actually uh, uh, spells that you are casting on the ground so you have like this circle and if people stand into the circle they will get healed and if they don't get uh, if they don't stand in the circle they will not get healed and it's funny because it's almost like a thing about consent you know so you can choose to stand in the healing circle or you can choose not to so we started to experiment a lot with indirect casting um, spells that you would cast on the ground, spells that you would cast on uh, um, a tree or something like that, uh, the environment. And it really worked well. We were even able to create a projectile spell, which in terms of mechanics, it's really nothing more than a projectile, but it was a cloud that was flying above uh, the plant and raining down on the plant. So through that indirect uh, um, casting of uh, the, the cloud flying above and raining down, it worked out and the game became more and more fun and well, friendly. So 
um, the last challenge that we had with spells and we absolutely wanted to solve is uh, crowd control effects. Uh, you know, stunning, freezing, burning, and so on. Um, not because we just like these things per se, but uh, they feel fun uh, if you use them in a game. And also, uh, they are an important part of a lot of roguelite dungeon crawlers because uh, they let you manage the enemies um, and, in our case, the plants. But, of course, uh, burning or freezing a plant you know, doesn't really feel like you're helping the plant. So um, in this case, we we talked a lot about, you know, what do the effects exactly do? And if you look at a burning spell, for example, it's nothing more than damage over time. And since we replaced damage with energizing the plants, you know, we were just like, okay, but then we can just create an energizing over time spell and that should work out. So in this case, and sadly it's one of the rare cases where it was a lot just about visuals, um, we could just take, you know, uh, 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 another visual representation for um, uh, a crowd control effect. So a plant stuck in a block of ice mm, doesn't feel too friendly. But uh, a plant taking a short nap because it was uh, walking into a, um, a sleep cloud or a sleep bubble. Well, that sure seems fine, right? So yeah. Um, last but not least, I also would like to talk about audio, at least for one tip, because that's an area that oftentimes gets overlooked. And it's also a fun case because in this one, we were able to take one of these uh, choosing techniques and just create our nonviolent version of it. So what we did was, you know, when you have a gun and you want to make it feel very powerful, then you can just add more bass and, you know, more oomph to the um, sound effects and it uh, contributes to the gun feeling a lot more powerful. So we were thinking about what would the non-violent equivalent of that be? And um, we started out with a very basic rewarding sound, something like if you pick up a coin or uh, uh, an item from the ground, you know, like this bling sound that makes you go, oh yes, endorphins. Um, and then we started thinking about how we can crank this up. And we tried a, a lot of different things until we had the idea of, you know, our plants have faces, which means they have mouths, which means that they can make noises. So we started to add these little laughing and uh, chuckling and, you know, like, yay sounds if plants get um, energized. And, you know, it was a complete game changer. So that worked really well. And if you ever get asked what the equivalent of adding more bass and explosions is in nonviolent game, well, it's more happiness and laughter. <laughs> All right. So yeah, that's almost my 30 minutes. So in conclusion, um, we knew from the start that this kind of project is a big experiment. And, you know, when you look at these two GIFs, which is on the left side, one from really early development and on the right side, one that we captured just some weeks ago, you can see that we have come a long way. But creating a nonviolent action gameplay loop is a huge challenge. And even though we have already been working on this game for two years and we had a huge focus on creating a satisfying and juicy second to second gameplay, it's still one of our biggest challenges and something that we have to put a lot of work in in the future. So yeah, nevertheless, um, if you want to try the game out as it is right now, um, go over to Steam, search Grimoire Rose. There's a free demo active right now. So try it out, give us feedback, wish list, you know, all the fun things. And yeah, uh, I'm looking forward to your questions. Yeah, excellent talk. Thank you so much. Uh, people very much enjoyed that. Uh, spawned all kinds of side discussions about sports <laughs> and also the Boba Kiki effect. And uh, yeah, 
fascinating stuff. I will try and get a little bit of time for questions because yes, we actually have quite a few. Um, so one question in terms of the balance. So you talked a lot about different ways to kind of skin and approach you know, roguelike action mechanics so that they had that more. Oh, sorry. I was going to crank myself down. I'm so sorry, audience. I got excited. Um, yeah, about kind of that, that skinning of familiar mechanics to feel you know more nonviolent. Were there also some mechanics that you think only work in this kind of nonviolent context and in, in Grimoire Groves that other roguelikes maybe haven't had? Oh, wow, that's a very good question. <laughs> Actually, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about how we can get, you know, mechanics into the game that players love that we um, haven't spent a lot of time to think about, you know, what would be unique uh, to, to such a sort of game. But yeah, sadly, I, I can't remember like one example on, from the top of my head, but very good question. <laughs> yeah, I, if you think of some, maybe in the breakout room, people can have that discussion. Um, another question from Hillex, how do you do game market research? Because that was interesting oh. of how that came into things. Okay, so um, I guess the next 30 minutes we're going to talk about <laughs> how, how to do market research. Um, we, we do our market research mostly based on um, Steam because, of course, the other platforms are kind of hard to get numbers. So we look at titles that are, you know, in, in the direction where we want to go. Um, and, and then we estimate how much sales they have and also over time, you know, not just at the beginning. Um, and it was, in this case, it was kind of interesting because there was nothing that was too close to our game. So at that point when we did the market research, the closest game in terms of mixing like cozy, nonviolent things um, to, with roguelite dungeon crawlers was uh, boyfriend dungeon because it mixed uh, 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 dating sims with with roguelite dungeon crawlers, um, and besides that, there was basically nothing similar. Now we do have um, Cult of the Lamb, which did really well. So th that was kind of one challenge that there aren't a lot of games that are very similar, but rather you can look at farming games and you can look at roguelite dungeon crawlers, but not both of them. Oh yes, Atomic Crops, of course, mm. would be one. Yeah, um, yeah. No, that, very that, good that's one. very, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's interesting. I, I hate to cut you off. I would love to keep on talking about it. Um, which, so uh, your breakout room is Mage. If people mm -hmm. want to, after the next talk, uh, go talk more about this, which it seems like probably people will. But thank you so much, Tabea. That was an uh, well. excellent talk. Uh, so thank you.